Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, where we're going to be going into the details of understanding and conquering chronic pain. My name is Dr. Jean Kesselman. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, certified applied prevention and health promotion therapist, and I'm the owner of Convergent Movement and Performance, located in Bridgewater, New Jersey, where I specialize in teaching people with chronic and unresolved pain or suboptimal health the precise ways to reclaim their lives and achieve their goals. So today's presentation is based on what the research and experience has shown to help the majority of people. But please keep in mind that each person is an individual. So the content and information within this program is educational only and should not be relied upon for the purpose of replacing formal medical care. Please be sure to consult with a licensed healthcare provider if you are experiencing undiagnosed pain, poor health, illness, or other symptoms, or if your condition is either worsening or not improving. It's important to check with your doctor prior to starting a health practice or routine and do not discontinue or modify any medication or other physician recommendations prior to speaking to your physician. So again, today's conversation and today's presentation is based on this topic of chronic pain. Just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when we're speaking about chronic pain, we're talking about pain that's lasted longer than three to six months. And usually it's lasted longer than the expected time frame for healing. Chronic pain is one of the most common reasons adults seek medical care and has been linked to restrictions in mobility and daily activities, dependence on opioids, anxiety and depression, and poor perceived health or reduced quality of life. Population-based estimates of chronic pain among U.S. adults range from 11% to 40%. And in 2016, an estimated 20.4% of all U.S. adults had chronic pain, according to the Center of Disease Control. So in other words, this is common. It's very common. One out of every five people have pain that lasts longer than three to six months and longer than the expected or what was expected to be the time frame for healing. So the question becomes, what's the underlying cause? What's going on that's making pain last so long and become chronic, right? And to answer this, we first need to really establish an understanding of what pain is in general. So the formal definition of pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So yeah, uh, let's break that down a little bit. If we go back to the definition here, there are a couple of points that I really want to emphasize, right? So first, everyone, let's um, kind of hone in on the fact that pain is a sensory and an emotional experience. So emotion is a significant aspect of pain. It's not just about the feeling, right? It's about the emotion as well that comes along with it. And then the other piece that I really want to point out in this definition is the fact that at the end it says that it's associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So actual or potential. And that's extremely important. And we're going to be going into all the details of why these aspects are extremely important moving forward. But I just wanted to take a little bit of time to really read the definition and 
begin kind of thinking in this direction where we need to be paying attention to not just the sensation of pain, but the emotion that goes along with it and the fact that it's associated with actual or potential tissue damage. All right, so let's start going into the details of how this all works. Now, let's say you stepped on a rusty nail and it got stuck in your foot, right? Would you want to know? Would you want to know that kind of information if it happened? Well, of course you would, right? I don't think too many people would say, oh, no, it's fine. Let that nail stay stuck in my foot. No, you'd, you'd want to know. But how would you know? And the answer is, you know, because of pain, you'd experience pain, pain would be the signal that would tell you that something is going on. And we experience that pain through our nervous system. So our nervous system is the thing that allows us to experience pain. If there was no nervous system, there would be no pain. And our nervous system, remember, involves our brain, spinal cord and all the nerves that come out of the spinal cord and travel throughout our body. To really understand how this whole process works, it's important to realize that the nervous system works just like a built-in alarm system. So how does an alarm system work? That's the big question. If we understand how the alarm system works, we'll understand how the nervous system works and we'll understand pain. So if you look at the picture here on this slide, looking at an alarm system, you're gonna see that in the middle, you have that control center, right? That's the piece of the alarm system that holds all of the information, keeps all of the settings, that's where you put all of the codes in. And then those little things around that control center are the sensors and they get put around the house if we're talking about an alarm system in the home, right? So these sensors are put around the house and then the sensors pick up information. Then the information that those sensors pick up gets sent to the control center and based on that information, the control center determines based on all the settings to either set, to either have the alarm go off or not go off, right? And even if the alarm goes off, how do you turn it off? If you, if the alarm is go is um, is set off and it's and you can hear it, how would you turn the alarm off? Well, you'd go to the control center, put in the right codes, and the alarm would turn off. So this is just like how our nervous system and how pain works. In this situation, the control center is our brain and spinal cord. Well, the sensors are all the nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord. So all those nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord pick up information based on what's going on and they send the information over to the control center, over to our brains. And that is where, where the brain is where the decision of whether or not pain occurs, that, that's where it happens. That's where that decision is made. So all the nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord, they pick up information, only information. They send it over to the spinal cord and brain and at the spinal cord and brain, there's that decision of whether or not pain should occur or should not occur. So let's take a look at these sensors that are going on outside of our brain and spinal cord. The first critical thing to understand is that there actually is no pain sensor. There is no part of our nervous system or no part of our body that actually picks up pain. There are five critical th pieces of information that are picked up by the nerves that get sent over to the brain, okay? And if you understand these five um, categories of information, we can really hone in on understanding parts of the cause of the pain that you may be experiencing. 
So here are the five uh, categories of things that your nerves are picking up or the sensors are picking up and then sending over to the brain. First, it's temperature. So temperature in and of itself can affect the experience of pain. So just think about it. Have you ever noticed any changes in how you feel based on whether it's a cold day or a warm day, right? Based on whether you're taking a nice warm shower or you're taking a cooler shower, if you put on a hot pack or a cold pack, have you noticed that these things may affect the way that you experience pain? And for many, many people, it does. Many people will say that the weather has an effect on their pain and either cold days or warm days or hot days may affect pain for better or for worse. So that's the first thing to realize, that temperature in and of itself can affect the pain that you may be experiencing. Next, the other category is immunity. So various different immune cells, when they're running through our body, those immune cells in and of themselves can increase or decrease pain, okay? So another way of looking at these immune cells is inflammation. And so in areas where there is inflammation, inflammation in and of itself can create pain, right? So think about it. If for many people that maybe have sprained their ankle or have had an injury and it swells up and it's hot, swollen, different colors, it, there are a bunch of immune cells that are going over there. Inflammation is your immune system. And that inflammation in and of itself can aggravate pain. So also think about if you've ever had the flu, have you ever experienced body aches? So many people that have had the flu will say that they felt body aches, right? There was no injury to the body in that situation. But you've had these immune cells, white blood cells, various other cells with your immune system running through you and they in and of themselves are aggravating and can be creating the pain. And that's why that's one of the reasons why you have these body aches when you have the flu. And then finally, there are even conditions like chronic inflammatory conditions. So think psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and there are very many other conditions where in those conditions, there is increased inflammation. And that increased inflammation is what brings on the pain. There may have been no specific injury, but the inflammation is creating the pain. So then the next piece that, that may be, um, or the next kind of category of information that these sensors may be picking up are mechanics. And this is what most people think of when they think of pain. Mechanics have to do with different movements or pressures. So think the way that you're moving, your postures, um, various different exercises, things like that, that falls under the category of mechanics. Now, most people understand that piece, right? Like the way that you move or a pressure that's put on you can create pain. And so I don't really need to go into too many of the details on that, I think, but it's important to realize that that is just one fifth of the equation. Those are not the only things that create pain. Many times people will come in and say that they have knee pain and wonder, well, what's the movement that caused pain or, or what's the position or does it have to do with the posture? Does it have to do with an exercise? Does it have to do with the way that I'm bending over or squatting? But again, that's just one fifth of the equation. That's only one fifth of the potential reasons that you're feeling pain in the knee. And that can be important, but that's not the only thing in people. It, any one of these five can create pain and it might have nothing to do with movements or pressures or things like that. It could have, one of, could have to do with one of these other sensors. So now moving on, the next sensor that we'll talk about is circulation or blood flow. Changes in blood flow are another thing that can create pain. If there's less blood flow going to an area, you will often experience pain. So kind of in the real world, you may see that in a number of ways. 
first sitting for prolonged periods of time can change circulation. And with that in and of itself can create pain, right? Not moving decreases circulation to certain parts of the body and you may begin to experience pain just from that. Another piece is that if a part of your body does become injured, the only way that it heals is through blood flow. It's the nutrition and all the healthy chemicals that are moving through your blood that allow a part of your body to heal. And if there is reduced circulation to an area of your body, it won't get the nutrition and all the important chemicals and things needed in order to heal, right? And so uh, important considerations with that also include things like smoking, which change circulation, decrease circulation. And that's why many times um, a lot of healthcare professionals will ask, are you smoking, right? And the question, and the whole thing is, why do we ask that? Why is that important? The reason it's so important is that if you are smoking, it changes blood flow. And blood flow changes how much nutrition an area of your body that is healing is getting. So with smoking, it decreases your ability to heal and that can increase pain, okay? All right, and then the last sensor that can potentially create pain or can pick up information, right, associated with pain is stress. And this is a big one. Now, when we speak about stress, we're not just talking about the emotional component, although the emotional component is involved. In this case, what we're saying is that the physiological aspect of stress may create pain. So in stressful situations and conditions, we release certain hormones and neurotransmitters, for instance, cortisol and, um, and adrenaline. And when those are running through our bodies, they can change how we perceive pain. In certain situations, they can decrease pain, but in other situations, they can increase pain. And so understanding stress plays an enormous impact on understanding the pain that you may be experiencing. And we're going to be talking all about that moving forward in this presentation. So the point again of this slide is that there is no part of our body, there are no nerves outside of our brain and spinal cord that pick up pain. It doesn't exist, right? What they're doing is picking up information based on these five categories, temperature, immunity, mechanics, circulation, and stress. Then it'll send information on those five things to the brain and spinal cord. And that is our control center. This is where the decision of pain or no pain occurs, okay? So one important piece that I do wanna spend a little bit of time talking about is that unfortunately, there are many people out there that will say things like, oh, your pain is just in your head, right? The, you're, you're making this up, it's in your head. This isn't real, it's in your head. And unfortunately, they're not quite educated on the process of pain and how pain really works. Because the truth is 100% of the time in every situation, pain is always in the brain always. It doesn't matter if it's an ankle sprain, if you get hit by a stick, if you get into a car accident, or if you've had pain for 10 or 20 years. Pain is always experienced in the brain. So we need to come out of that association where there is normal pain and then there is the fake pain in the head. Right, because that, that just shows a clear uh, misunderstanding of how this whole process works. All pain is in the brain and all pain is also real, right? Just because you may or may not have an injury doesn't change the fact of whether or not you're experiencing pain. If, if you feel pain, your pain is real and that pain is always happening 
in the brain. Okay. So we'll keep going with, with, with this and get even a clear understanding of how it all works, but that's an important piece to understand. So let's take a little bit of even closer look at all of this now. So if you look at the graph here, the blue lines that's showing our nervous system activity and how it um, is affected by the sensors. So let's say a sensor goes off and so you might get a little bit of an increase in the nervous system activity and then it kind of calms down a bit and then it goes off and it's just moving along. But if you look at this picture, as long as it's underneath that red line, you won't experience pain. It's just information that the sensors are picking up. And so you have this window of tolerance, as we call it, this amount of room where the sensors can go off, but you're not going to experience any pain. It's just, it's just information that your brain is picking up, okay? But every now and then, something comes along and triggers a sensor to go off to such an extent that it hits that red line. And once it goes past that red line, you begin to experience pain. So the question is, what are those triggers? What are those things that can make a sensor go off enough to trigger pain? There are three main triggers. There's illness, trauma, and then there's this gradual process of either overuse or underuse, or another way of thinking about it is overstress or understress. Okay, so let's begin with illness. This is an important one that unfortunately is not talked about enough. So I'm, I want to really put an emphasis on it because this is information that I believe everybody should know and understand. So the thing is, is that various different illnesses, including various different organ conditions, can create pain in and of themselves and can create pain that feels like an injury or a pain to like a bone or a muscle, right? So for instance, liver and gallbladder conditions, if you have a condition that involves liver and gallbladder, you may feel shoulder, right shoulder or neck or um, shoulder blade pain. So you may be feeling pain in your neck, in your shoulder or your shoulder blade but you may have nothing wrong at all with those parts of your body. But the pain is coming from the liver and the gallbladder, right? Another example is that kidneys, if there's anything going on with the kidneys, they can create low back and hip pain. And finally, the lung and the diaphragm also can create left-sided neck pain. And these are just some examples. There are many other examples. And if you look at the chart, you'll see other organs, right? This is important information. And when anybody comes in to see me in my clinic, this is the first thing that I wanna make sure isn't going on, that the pain isn't coming from something not related to bones or muscles or cartilage or things like that, because this can happen, okay? And so again, the nerves don't actually pick up, oh, organ um, disease or something. No, they pick up information from the sensors. So what are the sensors involved here? There's temperature and think about fever, right? When we are sick, we experience fevers and that in and of itself can change our experience of pain. There is the immune sensor. So we may be having various different immune cells running through us. There's circulation. So in, in, some of these conditions, there's a change in blood flow. And finally, there may be um, physiological aspects of stress that are going on with these conditions, right? So different, let's say, heart conditions or other organ conditions can affect um, hormones, neurotransmitters like cortisol and adrenaline and things like that, right? So if those are happening, they could again um, affect the way that you're experiencing pain. So that's the first trigger, an illness. The second trigger is a trauma where there is a very specific injury. So think like you did trip and twist your ankle, right? So very clear cause, 
you know exactly where the pain came from. And in this situation, there are three different phases of normal healing, and it's very predictable. And so the first phase is inflammatory, right? That's when everything is swollen, discolored. And so the sensors that are involved in that case are the temperature sensor and the immunity sensor. And in this phase, beneficial cells and chemicals are transported to the injured area to initiate repair. And it usually takes about two to five days in most cases. Then the next phase will begin and it's the rebuild phase. And here, the sensors involved are immunity, the mechanical sensor and circulation. And in this phase, new tissue is beginning to form and mature, and it usually takes on average three to six weeks. And then finally, the last phase is remodeling, where here the main sensors that might pick up information and can end up resulting in pain are the mechanical sensor, the circulation sensor, and the stress sensor. And in this uh, phase of healing, tissue is becoming stronger and the average duration is about six weeks to six months. So that's all normal. The pain experienced in these phases is totally normal, and it's being picked up by those specific sensors that I just mentioned. Because again, there are no sensors picking up pain, just information. And the information that I mentioned in each one of those phases are what's involved in terms of sending to the brain, and the brain will determine pain or no pain. And then the final potential trigger of pain is a gradual overuse or underuse. So overuse can be things like a lot of physical activity, whether that's exercise or you just did something, or you've been doing something strenuous for a long period of time, you have a physically demanding job. Underuse can be things like sitting for prolonged periods of time, right? Being at the desk for hours and hours and hours and working on the computer, right? So in these situations, the pain comes on gradually, and the sensors that are involved are mechanical or circulatory. So again, the position that you're in, it's putting pressure on certain tissues. That can be aggravating, and it's also decreasing circulation. If, if you're, let's say, sitting for too long of a period of time, there's going to be decreased circulation. That can be affecting pain. Stress in certain situations can be affecting pain as we talked about. And then sometimes there's this low level of inflammation happening and that's where the immunity sensor comes in. Okay. So the big thing to understand though is that our bodies are designed to heal. There is a normal healing process when we have these conditions. So we mentioned three different categories of triggers, right? There's trauma, there's a um, illness, and then there's this gradual overuse or underuse. If there's a condition involving illness, that's something that you work with with your physician, and as the illness gets better, the pain gets better. In terms of trauma or overuse or underuse, all of our tissues, so when I say tissue, I mean bones, cartilage, ligaments, muscles, tendons, they all have the ability to heal for the most part, and at least to some extent, as long as you provide the right atmosphere for healing. And then there's a certain amount of time that's normal for it to take to heal. So for instance, fractures on average five weeks to three months. Cartilage can be anywhere from two months to two years. Ligaments can be one week to six months, but if you had a full tear, severe sprain, it could be five weeks to a year. Muscle strains can be anywhere from two weeks to three months, but a full tear could be three weeks to six months. Tendinitis and other tendon conditions can be anywhere from three weeks to two months. And a severe um, tendon issue or a full tear can be five weeks to six months, depending on the condition. So as long as the right environment is there, these tissues do heal and it does take time and you may have pain throughout this whole process and that is normal, but they do heal. And so what's happening in that process? When things are healing, what is going on? That's the question, right? So let's look at this picture. Remember that on the left side of the graph, 
something got triggered. One of those things happened, right? Whether it was an illness, whether it was a trauma, or whether it was overuse or underuse, it was enough to trigger pain. It went be beyond that red line and you had pain. Now, as things begin to heal, you see how the nervous system activity gradually begins to go down. But the key is that it's gradual. It's not that it goes up, you feel pain, and then you're right back down to the bottom and everything is great. It's a very gradual process. And so let's compare the two graphs, the one that I showed before with the kind of normal low level activity and then this healing process. Remember how we talked about the window of tolerance, right? How much kind of information can the sensors pick up before it gets to a point where you experience pain? When things are normal and just moving along without anything, um, you know, without anything triggering it or without um, this uh, a situation of chronic pain or an injury, you have a pretty big window of tolerance. There is a lot of room where sensors can pick up information, but it won't lead to pain. But on the right, you're going to see the graph where after you experience pain, it's a gradual process, which means even little things that are picked up by the sensors can increase your pain, can actually reach the red line much quicker than what would be considered normal before you had the pain, right? So in the beginning, you have the pain and you begin to feel better, but even little things then will make the pain come back. So just think if you've ever noticed that you've the pain began and then you start to, oh, you have a good day, you start to feel a little bit better, but then you just do a little bit of activity and then the pain's right back. But of course it is, right? It's a gradual process for it to be able to get back down. The window of tolerance is very small initially after pain occurs. So if you experience pain, even once the pain then goes away, even then in that pain-free zone, the window of tolerance is still very small. So little things are going to trigger the pain again, but it does come down gradually over time. And so the question is, what determines the level? What makes it so that it's either at that low level or at the high level? And what determines how it's coming down? And the answer is the question, this question, right? The thing that answers it is the answer to this question. Am I safe? That's the question. It's not, is there damage? And that is so important to understand because the question of it, that's going through everybody's mind naturally, of course, is, What's wrong? What is damaged? Why am I experiencing this pain? What is the damage? But that is not the determinant of pain. Pain does not occur because of damage. Pain occurs based on whether or not the brain consciously or unconsciously determines that it is not safe. So remember, the body picks up information. Sensors pick up information and sends purely information up to the brain. The brain then looks at that information. This is all unconscious. This is all stuff that you're that is um, outside of your knowledge. This is happening in milliseconds, microseconds, right? So I'm not saying that you are thinking about these things. This is happening very, very quickly without our knowledge. But the information comes into the brain and then the brain determines, based on this information, am I safe? If it determines I am safe, there will be no pain. If it determines I am not safe, the brain will create pain. So the whole question is, am I safe? All right, so I know that it's definitely really hard to believe that pain and damage are not the relationship that we're looking at. And, and to say that it's more about safety. So I, I wanna take a little bit of time to really go through the research. And, and that way we can understand that this isn't just something that, um, that you know, you need to take my, my word for. You, you don't need to believe me on this. 
but we can look at the research and look at the facts. And so the really cool thing is that in the last number of years, there have been a lot of research looking at MRI or X-ray or imaging studies on people with no pain. So this is important for a number of reasons. In the past, what always used to happen, right, before they started doing this research, is that you would have pain, you'd go to the doctor, the doctor would image, you know, MRI, X-ray, CAT scan, whatever it is, something may come up on the imaging. And then of course, well, you see the, the issue on the image and say, okay, well, that's the cause of the pain, right? And that makes sense. Of course, that's how we do things, right? You have back pain, you get an MRI, you see a herniated disc, of course, the pain is from the herniated disc. But in the recent number of years, research has started to look at what MRIs look like on people with no pain at all. And the results have been really astounding, really, really surprising, all right? So let's look at some of those results of the studies looking at imaging, like x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, things like that, on people with no pain. So we'll begin with the neck. An MRI study of healthy adults and seniors ages 21 to 83 years of age found that 98% of all the men and women with no neck pain had evidence of degenerative changes on their cervical discs. 98% had these changes, had damage. Remember, we're talking about damage. We have degenerative changes, but they have no pain. There is no pain going on. Now looking at the upper back, an MRI study of healthy adults with no history of upper or lower back pain found that 47% had disc degeneration, 53% had disc bulges, and 58% had disc tears in their thoracic spine, which is their mid and upper back. Amazingly, 29% of these healthy adults had a disc bulge that was actually deforming and pressing on the spinal cord, yet they did not even know about it, right? The disc herniation was so severe that it was actually putting pressure on the spinal cord, but there was no pain. They didn't even know they had any issues. This was taken on healthy people just for research, right? Okay, moving on. In one research experiment, over 70% of people in their 20s, 70% in their 20s, had disc bulges in their neck, none had pain. Another research study took MRIs of people that didn't have any back pain and found 37% of everyone in their 20s, 80% of everyone in their 50, or everyone that was 50, and 90, 6% of those that were 80 have disc degeneration. 30% of 20-year-olds, 60% of 50-year-olds, 84% of 80-year-olds have disc bulging, right? Those are huge numbers. So it turns out that some of these changes are simply a normal part of the aging process. Let's move on to the shoulder. MRI studies of adults who have no shoulder pain show that 20% have partial rotator cuff tears and 15% have full thickness tears. In addition, in those over the age of 60, 50%, half, half of everybody over 60 who has no shoulder pain. So not just half of everybody over 60 with pain, but half of everybody specifically with no pain have a rotator cuff tear on their MRIs and they didn't even know about it. A study on professional baseball pitchers showed that 40% of them had either partial or full thickness rotator cuff tears and yet had no pain while playing and remained pain-free even five years after the study. Let's move on to the hip. The research shows there is only a week, week, association between joint space narrowing seen on hip x-rays and actual symptoms. 
MRIs of asymptomatic, again, pain-free people, 15 to 66 years old, revealed abnormalities in 73% of hips, with labral tears being identified in 69% of the joints, right? 69% of hips with no pain had labral tears. Another study showed that 77% of healthy hockey players who had no pain had hip and groin abnormalities on their MRIs. Another study um, looked at a total of 2,114 pain-free people, pain-free hips, and it showed that 37% had what's called a cam deformity impingement, which is a type of condition in the hip where part of the bone may be pinching on another part of the hip and you experience pain. 67% demonstrated pincer deformity impingement, so it's another condition similar. It's again something where there is pinching because of changes in the bony structure. And then 68% demonstrated a labral injury. So that's out of 2,114 people with no pain, 68% had a labral injury. Let's go on to the knee. 19 to 43% of pain-free people over the age of 40 presented with osteoarthritic changes. 100% of pain-free collegiate basketball players, 100% in this study, of pain-free collegiate basketball players presented with at least one structural abnormality on their MRI, including fat pad edema, patellar tendinopathy, meniscus tears, and more. 47.5% of professional NBA players presented with cartilage lesions. That's almost one out of every two NBA players in this study had cartilage damage. 20% of the same group presented with meniscus damage. But again, in all of these people mentioned, completely pain free. 64.3% of adolescent athletes, so between 14 and 15 years old, presented with at least one abnormality on the MRI for their knee versus about 32% in um, who did not play sports, still in the same age range, but who did not play sports, okay? But in both groups, completely pain-free. And finally, let's look at the foot. Although there is an association with plantar fasciitis and heel spurs, it should also be noted that 32% of people with no foot pain or heel pain have heel spurs visible on their x-rays. So again, that's a lot of information that we just went through. But the point is that there's a lot of people that may have damage, but no pain. The damage itself does not lead to pain. Many of times, first of all, the, the what looks like damage can just be a normal process of aging. But secondly, e- even when there is actual damage from let's say an injury, it still doesn't mean that there will be pain. But now let's look at the opposite. We know that damage doesn't always lead to pain. We know that. But pain also doesn't always mean that there's damage. Just because you experience pain doesn't mean that there's actually damage going on. So I like to talk about a really interesting um, uh, paper that was kind of published or or a, a case that was published in the British Medical Journal where a builder, age 29, came to the accident and emergency department, so basically the ER, having jumped down on a 15 centimeter nail. So jumped down, landed on a 15 centimeter nail, and it went through the foot. So if you look at the picture, you can actually see the case where the nail went through the foot upon landing. The smallest movements of the nail were so painful when he got to the ER, it was so painful to do anything that he was sedated with fentanyl and midazolam, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but basically they're very 
very strong painkillers, extremely, extremely strong painkillers, because the pain was so severe that they couldn't do anything. They couldn't help him, that nothing could be done. And so they needed to find some way possible to be able to decrease this pain. So they had to give extremely, extremely potent painkillers to finally bring it down. Then the nail was pulled out from below. And when his boot was removed, a miraculous cure occurred. Despite entering proximal to the steel toe cap, the nail had actually penetrated between the toes. So the foot was entirely uninjured. In other words, the nail didn't actually go through the foot, but he experienced such intense pain that the only way anything could be done was with some of the strongest painkillers imaginable. And the thing to realize is that, you know, many people be like, oh, was he crazy? Was something going on? No, this is, a, this is how we are built, right? A nail goes through, you visually see it. Remember, the question of pain is not damage, not damage, right? That's, that's out. The question is, am I safe? And if you have a nail stuck through the foot and you're seeing this happen, trust me, the body's creating a ton of pain, right? There, there is going to be a lot of pain because, because it, as far as the brain knows, there is something very big going on and we need to fix this. All right, so pain will happen. So again, damage doesn't always lead to pain. Pain doesn't always mean there's damage. So pain and damage are not always linked. Sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. But the question is, am I safe? So, why does pain persist? Let's get to the point, right? Like, why does pain continue then, right? It started, but it's not going away. Why is it still around? Now, let's look back at the charts. Instead of this happening, right, where you had the pain and it's gradually going down, that's normal, right? In the beginning, every little thing's going to make it hurt, but over time, you can do more and more and more, without the pain and then eventually you're back at that nice low level and you can do normal everyday things. That is a normal healing process. But instead of that, we get this. We get it so that it starts to go down, but then it stays elevated and it's not going down any further. So if you look, that window of tolerance is so small that every little piece of information that could be picked up by those sensors it may end up triggering that pain. It's, it's much closer to that red line. And so if the right information is picked up by the right sensor, it may trigger the pain. And so in these situations, another way of looking at it is the alarm stays sensitive, right? You have a very, very sensitive or somebody with chronic pain has a very sensitive alarm system. So let's go back to that alarm system um, analogy for a second, right? I'd like to tell a, a little bit of a, it's a true story, right, of, of this inaction in terms of an alarm. So my first car, I was very fortunate in that I, I had a great first car and it had a very, very high-end alarm system in it. And I got the car in, in late fall. Right. And so, you know, through the winter, no issues, everything was good. When spring and summer came around, for some reason, the car alarm kept going off, right? It was in the driveway and it kept going off and kept going off and kept going off. And we couldn't understand why the alarm keeps going off. There's nothing around, nothing's happening. The alarm keeps going off. What we ended up realizing was that the alarm went off when the windows were down, right? So if I kept the windows cracked a little bit, that's when the alarm would go off. And what we further realized is that it would go off when the window was cracked and there was wind. So this, oh, this car had such a nice alarm system and it, such a powerful high-end alarm system in it, 
that actually have sensors that can sense movement through the window, right? Or would be in line with the window in case somebody was gonna like reach in, right? So if somebody was gonna take their hand, try to reach into the window, the alarm would go off. But what was happening was that wind would actually set the alarm off. So if I kept the window open a crack and there was some wind, then that wind would set off the sensor, right? Or, or the wind would be picked up by the sensor. Movement would be picked up by the sensor. So that kind of goes back, you know, movement gets picked up by the sensor just as we have a sensor for mechanics for movement. Movement would get picked up by the sensor, travel to the control center, and then the car, car alarm would go off. And that is exactly how our bodies work. It is picking up information, but our alarm system, if we've been in pain for so long, our alarm system becomes so strong. We have such a high end alarm, such a high quality alarm system that every little thing is going to end up triggering it because our alarm system is so good that it, it's gonna tell our brains everything, right? It's gonna pick up everything because it's gonna do whatever possible to keep us safe. So the big question now is what keeps the alarm sensitive? Why did it stay sensitive? And again, to answer this question, remember what the alarm is looking at. It's looking at, am I safe? So the whole thing is if anything is out there that can potentially create a feeling of danger, it will keep the alarm sensitive. So what are those potential things? Failed treatments, ongoing pain, different explanations. So again, if, you have, if you're going to different people and everybody's giving you different explanations, you don't know what to believe, right? There's so much confusion and that's very dangerous to the mind, okay? Fear, anxiety, depression, job issues, starting to get job issues from this pain. Your job is beginning to get affected by the pain. Family concerns. There's, there are aspects of your family life, your personal life that are beginning to be affected by this pain. All of that it is quite the opposite of safety. And so these are the things that keep the alarm sensitive. And because of the sensitive alarm, when those five sensors get picked, or you know, those five sensors pick up information, even a little bit of information is going to end up creating the pain or triggering that pain. So again, keep in mind that if consciously or unconsciously, the brain is asking, what if, what if this, what if this, what if this happens? What if this never gets better? What if, what if, what if? Or if it's asking, what's going on? I don't understand this. What is going on? Those questions are not safe. There is no feeling of safety in those questions. So ask yourself, have, have any of those things gone through your mind at any point? Wondering, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this doesn't get better? What if this? There's no safety. And then asking, but what's going on? I don't get it. What can still be creating this pain? There's no safety. And because of that no safety, the smallest pieces of information through those sensors can trigger this pain. So remember, before we move on, I do want to again go back to the point that if you are experiencing this, you are not alone. One out of every five, one out of every five people in the U.S. have some form of chronic pain. Okay? They may not talk about it. You may not know everybody that has it, right? But the research has shown that one out of every five has some form of chronic pain. It's common and it happens often. You're not alone. Okay? And again, all of this stuff, if this is happening, the last thing it means is that somebody's crazy. Has nothing, like, of course not. That to think that they're crazy is crazy, right? And again, pain is always in the brain. So don't let anybody, don't let anybody end up negating your pain, saying that, oh, it's just in your head. Pain is always in the head, always, right? There, there's never a situation pain isn't. It doesn't mean that it's being made up, right? So let's keep everything 
in perspective. So let's go through another scenario to really, really, you know, bring this home now, okay? Let's pretend you are sitting on the couch, watching TV, going through social media, checking out pictures, videos, whatever it is. You're hanging out, relaxing, everything is good, everything is cool, right? And then all of a sudden, this guy shows up. This guy jumps out from the door and is staring right at your face. All right, just take, take a moment to think about that. Are you in that moment thinking about your posture? Are you thinking about your muscle activation? Are you thinking about eating? Are you thinking about drinking? Or, or you know, maybe, maybe you're thinking about reproducing in that moment, maybe? Or how about the book you read? How about responsibilities at work? What you did yesterday, what you did today, or what you're gonna do tomorrow? Yeah, I, I doubt it, <laughs> right? You're probably not thinking about any of those things if that lion is jumping out at you. Well, why not, right? Well, that all goes back to understanding the nervous system. And there's a part of the nervous system that I'd like to speak about to really kind of drive some ideas home. There's a, so our nervous system um, interprets stress in various ways. And there are two, there's a part of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And that's a part of our nervous system that controls the automatic processes of our body. And it's divided into two sections, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And these are the two sections that are associated with understanding stress, okay? So if you experience stress, if humans experience stress, and stress is anything that brings us out of our comfort zone. So when we're talking about stress, we are not just talking about an emotional situation, though emotion is involved in stress. We're talking about anything that brings us out of our comfort zone. That could be emotional, that can be physical, right? Exercise is a stressor, brings us out of our comfort zone. Doing a, um, a very physically demanding activity brings us out of our comfort zone. Those are all stresses. Pain in and of itself is a stressor. There is nothing comfortable about pain, right? If pain was in our comfort zone, we probably wouldn't call it pain. So by definition, pain is outside of our comfort zone. So by definition, pain is a stressor, okay? So we have this division in our nervous system and we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our nervous system associated with the stress response. F fight, flight, or freeze. Then we have our parasympathetic nervous system, and that's the part of our nervous system that does the opposite, rest, digest, and recover. So let's take a look at what happens when we're feeling stress. What actually goes on physiologically in our body? How, do, how does the human body react to a stressor? All right, that's the sympathetic part of the nervous system, fight, flight, or freeze. So something brings us out of our comfort zone, our alertness, goes up, okay? We get, we get a shot of adrenaline. Now in, now in a short-term stressor, that's actually a very good thing, actually. So for instance, let me say, there, there are many times, and maybe you can think of it, where because of adrenaline, you actually didn't feel any pain, right? You'll often hear athletes say, there's so much adrenaline, I didn't feel the injury when it happened, okay? Car accident, you don't feel it right away. So in the short term, this is actually a great process. The, that, the stressor that happened, the adrenaline might help in the short term to decrease the pain, okay? Then our pupils dilate and they dilate because in a stressful situation, you wanna see everything that's really important. Then our vigilance goes up. Vigilance is is our tendency to look for what can go wrong. This is very important for survival. If you're under a stressor, 
then you want to see everything going wrong to make sure you stay protected. But keep that in mind because under chronic stress or under chronic pain, because remember chronic pain is chronic stress and chronic stress leads to chronic pain, so it's endless circle. Under chronic stress, that vigilance stays. In other words, you're always looking for what can go wrong. The longer you've been in, in pain, the longer you've had chronic pain, the more you are hardwired. Again, nothing wrong with you. This is part of our DNA. We are hard hardwired the longer we're in this state to look for the thing that's wrong. And if we're looking for the thing that's wrong, then we're only gonna see the thing that's wrong, right? It's all that we're looking for. And if we see that, it's not safe. And remember, the question of the alarm system is, am I safe? But if the only thing you're looking at is what is not safe, you're only gonna see what's not safe. And so the alarm sensitivity is only going to go up. So then our sensation goes up, we feel more, and our pain then obviously goes up with chronic stress and chronic pain. Remember, a, a quick stressor, if everything is good and it's just a short little stressor, we actually might have decreased pain. Remember the adrenaline, all of that, what athletes feel, your pain could actually go down. But if you have this pain that's constantly there in day in and day out, then this pain, the pain sensitivity actually goes up, okay? With all of that going on, heart rate starts to go up. So this could affect your cardiovascular system, right? The way that your heart's work by constantly having to work so hard, your heart rate goes up. Blood vessels change. And remember, this impacts one of the sensors. Remember that the way that circulation happens changes how we experience pain. And then finally, our breath rate changes. We might breathe faster or, and more shallow. Another thing with chronic stress is that affects digestive organ function. We're not gonna go into the details of this one. They're in some of the other presentations that I put on that you can watch, but it can, but basically chronic stress, chronic pain can affect the way your digestive system works. Then it affects cortisol release. It affects blood sugar. So remember some, something's painful. You have this lion that's in front of you. And so you're, your body knows that it needs more energy to be able to fight this thing or run away from this thing, right? So it, needs, it knows it needs more energy. What is one of our greatest sources of energy? Sugar. That's one of our greatest sources of energy. And so our body tries to put more sugar into our blood. How does it do that? One of the ways is through cortisol. One of the things cortisol does it is it triggers our body to put more sugar into our bloodstream so that we have more energy in these stressful situations. So in the short term, this is a fantastic thing, right? We, we gotta get past the stressor, but if this is a constant stress, constant pain day in and day out, it could change the way blood sugar is in your body and it could change the way insulin functions and eventually it could affect diabetes, right? And then finally, it affects the immune system. This chronic pain or stress affects um, inflammation. So in the long term, when you have this constant chronic stress and pain, inflammation will begin to go up. And then your overall immune strength and function can go down. So when you experience this stressor for long periods of time, then it has a number of negative effects. In a short-term stressor, if you, just, if you have a quick stressor, and then you're able to get through it. These are all great things. They're there for survival. They're meant to be there. But if this is going on for days, weeks, months, years, that's when all these changes begin to occur. So to go back to our example of the lion, living with chronic pain is like living with the lion. The lion is following you around all day long, all day, every day. Okay, so it's not like the line just jumps out and you get past it. That would be what I was calling that short-term stressor. If you if it jumps out, but then you get away and you're okay, great. But chronic pain is living with the lion. This lion follows you everywhere you go. 
And so chronic pain is associated with changes in movement mechanics, muscle function, immune function, digestion, hormonal function, reproductive activity, focus, concentration, emotional health, like anxiety and depression, and even affects overall motivation. And again, th this is hardwired in us. This is how our nervous system works with stress. And pain is a stressor. And remember that as the longer you have pain, it increases stress, but increased stress, increased fear, increases the sensitivity to pain. So it becomes this cycle. And that's the difficulty with all of this. So the question is, are we hopeless? So I presented all of this, but okay, great. Now we see all these things going on. This, you know, what do we do with this? Are we hopeless? But no, of course not. That's why we're here. That's why we're having this presentation. We all have the power to make drastic changes in our personal health, wellness, and performance. And this program aims to prove it, all right? So it's time to take action. Let's speak a little bit about what needs to actually be done in these situations of chronic pain. So the essential part of being able to conquer chronic pain is to understand pain. You need to establish a deep, a deep understanding of your pain. So what does that mean and why? So first, we need to understand what pain is in general. And that's what we've been doing throughout this presentation. This presentation was geared so that we now understand what pain is in general. We know now that pain does not mean that there is damage. There may be, there may not be, but there are a number of factors that need to be thought about. And, that, and those different factors include those five sensors and all of that, right? So we need to understand when we have pain, what, what are the possibilities that it can mean? And to not immediately begin thinking that if we have this pain you know, for a long time, that it's definitely because of damage, okay? Then second, it's to understand your specific pain. The next goal is to, you know, initially we were understand pain in general. You know, to conquer pain, we need to understand pain in general, the many things that can bring on pain, and the fact that pain is associated with safety or danger. So we understand that now. Great. The next step is to go on and understand your specific pain. And what does that mean? What we need to do is determine what, or we're not, deter it is to determine, but the goal is for you as an individual you're going through this, if you are experiencing chronic pain, then it's important that you know exactly what makes you better. And you know exactly what makes you worse. And you know exactly what will lead to progress along your path. Okay. Extremely important. I'm emphasizing the fact you as an individual for a number of reasons. Right. So it's very important to go to a healthcare provider and make sure that they understand what's going on and that they are treating you correctly and that the right diagnosis is made. But once all of that is established, it is essential that you understand exactly what's going on, right? You want to know what makes you better because you need to know exactly what to do when pain strikes. If you have pain and you have no idea what can make you better, if you think nothing can make you better, right? There is so much danger in that unconsciously, right? So we're talking unconsciously, remember the whole process of how pain works in the mind. If you don't know what can make you better when you have pain, there is so much danger in that, that the alarm will go off. Then if you don't know what makes you worse, if you have no idea what might bring on the pain and you're kind of peeking around every corner, so to speak, then there is going to be so much um, danger and sensitivity in the pain. That is that vigilance that we were talking about, that stress, fight or flight vigilance, where you're only looking for what can go wrong because you're not really sure what can go wrong. So you're looking at everything, right? So a lot of danger and fear in that. So it's so essential that you understand exactly 
what makes you worse so that you know exactly what to do to modify um, or you know exactly what to modify in order to make you safe, okay? So again, extremely important to work with a healthcare provider, get the right diagnosis and make sure everything is clear and that the healthcare provider knows what's going on. But then it is essential for chronic pain. When we're talking about chronic pain, pain longer than three to six months, beyond the normal healing um, expected time frame, it is essential that you have a very clear understanding of exactly what makes you better and exactly what makes you worse. And you want to work with somebody that understands how to find these things and be able to help you discover these. So somebody that really specializes in having that cause and effect and being able to show you the cause and effect of all of this. Because I'm telling you that once you understand these things, it changes everything. So let's think about these, these possible, remember, what are the things that can make you better, can make you worse? Well, they can be any of the things involved with these sensors. So it's not just about what exercise do I do, that's part of it, but we want to consider all of these sensors. We need to figure out, does temperature affect what's going on with your pain? And if so, how? Does immunity affect what's going on with your pain? If so, how? Does mechanics, how? Does circulation, if so, how? And does stress, and if so, how? If any of these pieces are not being looked at carefully, then I highly suggest working with somebody that can look at these pieces and really determine how it affects your pain, right? It is, whenever anybody comes into my office, it is the goal to understand every one of these five sensors, to understand exactly how all of these pieces affect the pain, which ones may be impacting it, which ones may not be impacting it, and then we can really get to the bottom of figuring out what's going on, okay? And then finally, the solution, what do you do? Once you know what exactly is making you better, what exactly is making you worse, uh, what exactly, again, is affecting your pain, then the interventions or, or the actual actions, like what do you do, they involve what's called the five pillars or what I call in my practice, the convergence pillars of wellness and performance. Five different areas to really fit into the overall pain program, right? So an ideal, pain program for chronic pain is to involve all five of these factors, right? If you're only looking at one, that's great that you're looking at that one, but realize if you're still having pain, if it's still not resolved, look into whether or not you're missing any of these five factors, because the research has shown that all five of these factors affect pain, okay? So the first one is state, what I call state, and that is looking at the balance between stress and recovery. And we've talked all about the importance of, or how much influence stress and recovery have. The next piece is nutrition, then sleep, then movement, and then connection. So we don't have the ability to go into all of these details here in this presentation. And keep in mind, pain is so individualized that there may be, there, it may take a different approach in each one of these five pillars for each person with, a, with their pain, right? It does need to be individualized. But the point is that please consider all five of these. And then if you're not familiar with what really goes on in each one of these five, please watch one of the other presentations that I've done because I've gone into each one of these five pillars and explained what they are in different practices that can be used within each one of these. But keep in mind, those were general um, presentations and not for specific pain. So it is important that you work with a professional that truly understands your pain when incorporating every one of these five pillars. So now I'd like to take a little bit of time to speak about some of the common chronic pain medications that often are prescribed for those experiencing chronic and unresolved pain. Right, so there are two main categories, antidepressants or anti-anxiety pain medications, or anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications, 
and analgesics, which are painkillers. For the antidepressant and anti-anxiety medications, there are SSRIs, which increases the level of serotonin, and SNRIs, which work by increasing the levels of serotonin and norepinephrine. For the painkillers, there are two big categories, cannabinoids, which are cannabis and marijuana, and opioids, which are oxycodone, hydrocodone, codeine, morphine, fentanyl, and there are numerous other ones. So those are the two analgesic or two categories of analgesics that are often prescribed for more severe pain. But my question is now, did you know that we actually create our own? Did you know that we also create those same chemicals that those medications um, use to work, right? So each of the five pillars, each of those five areas that I spoke on, state, which are various practices to rebalance stress and recovery, nutrition, movement and exercise, sleep and connection, each one of those five have been shown to have a significant effect on either rebalancing and or creating serotonin, epinephrine or norepinephrine, dopamine, endocannabinoids, which are the natural cannabinoids, the natural marijuana-like um, chemicals inside of us, and then endorphins, which are the natural opioid-like chemicals inside of us. So I, want, I, I was excited when I found this paper that I can share with everybody, because one of the things that I often hear when I bring this up that we can create our own is that many people say, okay, I get it. We can maybe create some of it, but it, it, it's not nowhere near as good as what I get when I take the, the medication, when I, when I take all those other things that are prescribed. That's the real stuff. This stuff, I, the stuff you naturally do, that might kind of help, but I don't know. But the fact is that that's actually the exact reverse of reality. And so I wanted to show this one example. This is just one example. There are very many out there, but I found this paper and I just thought that it'd be useful to show in this context, right? So this paper was published Stanford University Medical Center, and this was all the way back in 1979. So this is old news. There is nothing new about what I'm about to say. But what this paper kind of showed and discovered was this. Scientists at the Addiction Research Foundation have discovered a new brain chemical 200 times more potent than morphine and 50 times more powerful than a previously identified chemical, beta endorphin. So the name of this chemical is dynorphin. And the point of why I'm sharing it is this. This is a natural substance, right? Discovered and found within our brain that we ourselves create. And it is 200 times more potent than morphine. 200 more times. Right. So it's not even a question of, oh, can we create something that maybe could be close to what we get with drugs? No. The drugs can't even come close to what our bodies can create. They're trying to, they're, they're working on it, but not even close. Right. What we create naturally is immensely powerful. And so not only with this chemical, but even look, it says, right, new brain chemical 200 times more potent than morphine and 50 times more powerful than endorphins. If it's 200 times more powerful than morphine, but only 50 times more powerful than endorphins, not only is this chemical so strong, but it also shows that um, endorphins are much stronger than morphine, right? So again, that, that's our natural opioids. Both of these are within the opioid family. So endorphins and this new, then this chemical they discovered in 1979, they're both immensely stronger than morphine, 
right? So the paper closes by saying, saying, or at least in, in the summary here, it closes by saying, the discovery of the substance is significant because it is a step forward in understanding brain chemistry and in particular, how mother nature regulates pain, All right? So this is how we naturally regulate pain. These chemicals, or if I go back one, where I said that the five pillars help to regulate serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, which by the way, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, you can think of as adrenaline. They're, they're, they're basically adrenaline. Dopamine, endocannabinoids, and endorphins, these chemicals that we naturally create, that drugs try to mimic, but these chemicals that we naturally create, this is how our alarm system gets set. These are actually the chemicals that are involved at either increasing or decreasing our sensitivity. So in other words, when our sensitivity, our alarm system is very sensitive, right? These chemicals don't quite work the way that we would like them to work. We either don't have enough or it's not in the right um, balance or proportions, or it just has a different effect. But when it's nice and low, where the sensitivity is low and correct, these are the chemicals that are controlling all that pain and making sure that we're not getting into, um, where we're not experiencing the pain, right? So it's these chemicals that are among the chemicals that help us to control pain naturally um, every day. And that is what sets or what helps control our alarm system sensitivity, okay? But then the important thing to realize is the role of chronic stress. Chronic stress, that sympathetic fight or flight nervous system activity changes the way we produce and react to these painkilling chemicals. So again, if, we, if everything is good and we suddenly have a stressful situation, all of those chemicals work very well together to help control the pain in a way that's right for that situation. But if we're under constant chronic stress or pain, those chemicals no longer um, work the way that we would like them to work. So it's extremely important that in any chronic pain program, we are really working on that state pillar, that ability to help rebalance stress and recovery, that sympathetic um, fight or flight nervous system versus the parasympathetic rest, digest, and recover system, right? So if we can help to get that uh, as balanced as we can, it could potentially help these natural chemicals work more efficiently and correctly, right? And, it, and that is why with less stress, right, with less of that fear, the alarm system goes down. Okay, so that brings us to the closing of our program. Let's piece everything together, okay? Let's summarize everything that we've went over. So first, pain is normal and necessary for survival. I'm not saying that having chronic constant pain is necessarily normal, but pain in and of itself is a normal process and we need it for survival. Pain is transmitted and experienced through the nervous system. The nervous system works like an alarm system. Signals and information are picked up by the sensors in the body, remember those five sensors, and they're picked up in the body, but pain is always created in the brain. The brain will create pain when it consciously or unconsciously believes that it is not safe. So in other words, there's a potential threat potential threat. And so remember back to the story about the car alarm and how just the wind set off the alarm. The alarm went off, but it does not mean somebody was breaking in. It just means that a sensor was triggered. We may have pain, but it doesn't mean that there is damage. It just means that a sensor was triggered. So after the threat occurs, the alarm becomes sensitive, but gradually decreases sensitivity as safety is reestablished. Remember, the sensitivity of alarm system is help regulated by those natural chemicals. That's what allow that alarm system analogy to work, right? 
So the more sensitive the alarm, the less those chemicals are imbalanced or the less efficiently or correctly they work. And the less sensitivity that your, the alarm system is, where it's not sensitive and you can do more, those chemicals are nicely imbalanced. So chronic pain occurs when the alarm system remains very sensitive and the sensitivity doesn't come down. The longer the pain persists, the more sensitive the alarm can become. But the good news is that there is a way to conquer the suffering. And it's based on your ability to understand your pain. It's all about a deep understanding of your pain, right? Understand what pain is in general, which is everything we've talked about today, but then also work with a professional to understand your specific pain. Get the right diagnosis, figure out what's going on, and then make sure that you as an individual understand exactly what you can do to make you better. And then exactly what you can do to that makes you worse, right? Again, it's not about what can the doctor, the PT, the chiropractor, the massage therapist, what can they do for me? Because even though there may be something that they can do, right? What happens when they're not there? They're not going to follow you around everywhere, right? And, and, and be there to, to do everything. At some point, you may be on vacation, you may be away, they may be away, and pain strikes. What will you do, right? We can, anybody in chronic pain, it's so important to not be, um, or, or anybody with chronic pain, it's so important to understand what is in what is under your control or what you can do to take action as an individual, not dependent on somebody else. It's important to get help when needed, but it's also important to understand what you can do because the more you understand about what you can do to make yourself better and what things you do that can make you worse, that decreases the fear, right? You know what you need to avoid, and you know what you need to do if you aren't feeling well. And so the fear goes down. And if the fear goes down, the sensitivity of the alarm system goes down. And over time, right, as long as you're doing the things that make you better and you're not doing the things that make you worse, over time, that alarm will begin to go down, okay? All right, so that brings us to the end of our presentation. I know that this was a long one and we covered a ton of information, but I really wanted to make sure that I put this out there. I was really able to share all of this because I know that so many people out there are suffering. Remember one out of every five people in the United States are suffering with some form of chronic pain. And unfortunately, there's so much fear that goes along with that. And I wanted to make sure that I can put this out there and help whoever may benefit from it. Now, again, I know this was a lot of information and it's not always easy to digest all of this. So if anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. This is what you know I, I do every day in terms of my profession. I specifically specialize in working with those with chronic and unresolved pain. The type of pain that has been around, again, beyond that three to six month mark and has gone past what was originally expected in terms of healing, right? And so if you have, if you have any questions about anything involving chronic and unresolved pain, please don't hesitate to reach out. Again, my name is Dr. Jean Kepselman. My practice is Convergent Movement and Performance located in Bridgewater. All right, so thank you again for joining me. And again, if anybody has any questions, I am here to help. Have a great day.